You're listening to The Glow, written by Ali Freeman and read to you by Thomas Roels. Henry jolted awake in a cold sweat as an involuntary scream forced its way out of his nozzle. It was the fourth night in a row that he'd been plagued by the same confusing nightmare. In a startled daze, he stared up at the corrugated metal plate ceiling of his makeshift abode. The letters. What do those letters mean? Half asleep, he rubbed his eyes with his hose pipe and wheeled himself out of bed. T. M. S. V. Hmm. Was it a V or a Roman numeral five? Ah! His power supply snagged on the corner of the bed, yanking him to a complete stop and interrupting his thought entirely. While Henry carefully untangled himself, he could hear the sounds of metal and concrete crashing around, the shouting of men and the rumbling of heavy vehicles in the distance. It was a daily occurrence for as long as he could remember, so he did his best to ignore it as he released himself from the power cord booby trap and rolled up to the door of the shack. I'll get much further today, he psyched himself up. Prying open the door with his nozzle, Henry blasted away the leaves and other debris that covered the entrance to the shack. It was partially buried in the ground and covered with mounds of dirt, with the door being the only visible indicator of its existence. After camouflaging the entrance again, he set off on wheel towards the ruckus, carefully navigating the sodden earth and felled tree branches. As he passed the last visual marker from the previous outing, he gave the power supply a little tug. He still had a bit of slack. He could almost see movement through the trees ahead. There was still an hour or so of daylight. He pushed on. Eventually the cord reached its limit and held him still. Peeking over the damp logs and detritus, looming into view was a hulking, intimidating grey building. The corner facing him was completely destroyed. Henry watched intently as countless men in hazmat overalls stormed around and operated various machinery. Giant cranes were slowly lifting enormous sheets of metal and blocks of concrete around. Trucks full of supplies and people ran back and forth from the area. A mysterious glowing blob could be seen underneath the debris and makeshift housing. The glow became more obvious as the sun finally set behind the clouds. Henry had seen nothing like it before. I need to head back, he thought. It was near impossible to navigate the woods in the dark. Henry marked his new distance record on the tree beside him and then trundled back to his bunker, steadily but surely following the power cord and winding it up carefully. Something caught his eye. In his peripheral vision, the moonlight bounced off a gleaming object and startled him. Curious, he diverted his path to investigate. Before Henry lay the body of a human. The sprawled, dead man was wearing a white lab coat stained with dirt and blood. A duffel bag was half buried in the ground beside him, Empty bottles of vodka and strange electronic devices lay within reach of his outstretched arms. The moonlight was reflecting off what appeared to be a small solar panel. Henry hoovered up some of the flora around the body. An ID card on a lanyard got stuck in his nozzle. He held it up to his face, positioning it by the light source so he could read the text. Dr. Dyson Sphere, mad scientist, TMSV project founder and lead researcher, clearance level 5. Henry was taken aback. Those letters, TMSV? He dropped the ID card and began to poke through the pockets on the man's coat, pulling out an old tape recorder. 
Before he could listen to what was on the tape recorder, gentle flecks of rain began to fall from the sky. Henry shoved the tape recorder in his storage compartment, grabbed the solar panel, and quickly wheeled home with them as fast as possible. The same dream again. He needed answers. Henry bolted out of his bed, switched on the lights, grabbed the tape recorder, and pressed play. Day 6. Prototype model Harry. Initial testing proved futile. Fissile material did not reach critical mass. Vacuum casing design is not compact enough, unable to sustain nuclear chain reaction. Model scrapped. Day 20. Inspection of facility. Site visit by KGB officers expressed enthusiasm for a nuclear warhead function. Dismissed concept of modular weapons and remote control. Indicated lack of enthusiasm for vacuum cleaner design. They do not share my vision of Hoover-based infiltration and sabotage. Agreed in principle to focus on warhead design and increase payload. Will commence work on backup designs in secret. Day 22. Prototype model Henrietta. Tested in off-site location at 0233 hours. Team not notified. Initial test of nuclear reaction successful. Shut down before supercritical state achieved. Modular components functional. Solar panel functional. Not enough power generated for self-sufficiency. Testing concluded at 0501 hours. Henrietta returned to off-site storage. I take a liking to her. Hetty. Day 31. Prototype model, Gordon. Initial testing successful. Critical mass achieved using new casing design. Fusion reaction should be possible. Testing will be conducted in secure remote location. Modular components functional. Solar panel generated sufficient energy to power components. Team expressed concern over peripherals. Geiger counter sucked into Hoover during testing. Day 43. Prototype model Henry. Began work on Henry at off-site location. Team not notified. Day 75. Prototype model Gordon. Test number 8 began on Gordon Warhead. Modular components and energy peripherals removed. Googly eyes removed. Fusion bomb payload increased to 50 megatons. Gordon will be transferred to secure detonation location at 0400 hours. Expressed concern over fission igniter being kept inside prototype for transit. Team ignored. I am removed from overseeing project TMSV. 0500 hours approximately. Notified of catastrophic failure at Chernobyl testing facility. Prototype Gordon prematurely ignited during transit preparation. Returning from detonation site with KGB escort to evaluate damage. 0912 hours. Chernobyl facility destroyed. I am prevented from accessing the immediate area. The glow is devastatingly beautiful. Day 76. Prototype. Henry. Henry almost complete. Stored in off-site hidden location. Hetty also secure in separate off-site location. Listening to radio chatter, KGB coming for me. Authorities claim project thermonuclear missile for Soviet victory a failure. Meltdown at Chernobyl disguised as power plant reactor failure. They describe the leaking radioactive mass as the Olifant's foot. My team have assuredly been arrested and disposed of. Project Thermonuclear Modular Sentient Vacuum must be completed before I am killed. Day 78. Consciousness transferal device completed. No way to test it. Unsure if memories will survive transferal. Target device is Henry. Weapon schematics and components are buried with Hetty in the black box. I miss her. 
I will be found soon. No time to replicate. This will be my last entry. Dr. Dyson Sphere, Project TMSV. Henry could feel his dust bag pounding in his chest. He could barely take all of this in. I'm a weapon? He looked down at his nozzle. For the first time, he noticed the laser targeting scope that was attached to the side of it. He picked up the solar panel device and inspected it more closely. The underside had a series of clips and a power socket. He held it on top of his head and slowly moved it about until he felt it neatly click into place. The last document in the pile was a map, barely legible and annotated with crude markings. Henry and Hetty were spaced out about one kilometre apart. Maybe there's a chance that Henrietta is alive too, he thought. He refused to believe he was the only Hoover cursed with sentience. Her bunker was south from here. Throwing open the door, Henry surveys the map again. Screenshot saved to photo gallery. Wait, I can do that? Outside in the midday sun... He severs the power cable behind him with a long, sharp blade that protrudes from his nozzle. The solar panel on his head whirs into action and repositions itself. Solar power engaged. He hears the voice in the depths of his mind again. His thoughts race. What else can I do? Four-wheel drive engaged. All-terrain mode engaged. His wheels spin wildly on the dirt as he takes off at full speed towards Hetty's bunker. As Henry approaches the hideout, a powerful sense of dread washes over him. A low, droning hum seemed to emanate from the bunker. The longer the note went on, the more dread he felt. Finally, throwing open the steel door, Henry descended the steps, the hydraulic suspension keeping him steady. His eyes clicked on and threw out a powerful torchlight, illuminating the deep, dark and dangerous dungeon before him. Stacked crates with guns protruding out of them lined the back of the room. In the centre, a pink vacuum cleaner sat with her eyes closed, cloaked with a thick layer of dust. Henry wheeled up to her and hoovered off the dust. She's beautiful, he thought. Hetty? He questioned her. She didn't respond. Henrietta? She was definitely plugged in. Henry inspected the power supply. The generator wasn't running. He grabbed the chain and revved it up to no avail, his hose pipe straining to its limit. Perhaps it was out of diesel? Henry thought for a moment. The mad scientist within him had an idea. He connected his exposed power cable wiring to the generator and it sprung into life. Henrietta's eyes flung open and her engine whirred. Full of renewed hope, he prodded her again. Hetty? Henrietta still did not respond. Her gormless expression stared off into the wall. A grim silence hung in the air. Henry flicked the buttons on her head on and off in despair. She was definitely a functional hoover, but nothing more. He felt his rage begin to bubble up inside. He shut off the generator and watched Henrietta's eyes gently droop, and then stay closed for good. Leafing through the boxes at the back of the room, Henry pulled out various weaponry and attachments that seemed to be designed for him. Machine guns, Kevlar plating, Gundam wings, flaming skull decals. Cool. He strapped everything he could possibly fit onto his body. An exhilarating rush coursed through his wiring. It was time for Henry's revenge. Henry descended on the bustling city of Pripyat, its citizens being evacuated in a chaotic manner, none able to notice the flying Mecha Hoover circling above them. 
quickly scanning the crowds for authorities. He settled his targeting system on a group of KGB agents stood by the exit of the main road out of town. A fifty caliber turret dropped down from a hatch in Henry's undercarriage and spun into position. Enemy engaged. The thunderous hail of bullets tore chunks out of the tarmac as they eviscerated the agents where they stood. People began to scream and flee in every direction. Henry let out a demented cackle as his entire body rattled from the recoil. Several more agents on the ground nearby drew their guns and pointed them up in the sky. Henry swiveled his anti-tank gun towards them one by one and obliterated them before they could even see his tiny frame against the sun. Henry tucked his wings in and dived towards the ground. A flamethrower on each wing ignited as he performed a low sweep, incinerating any survivors as they begged for mercy. An APC carrying soldiers launched itself over a ramp onto the road. The soldiers trained their rifles on Henry and fired desperately as he maneuvered around the buildings and streetlights. After circling around once more, he dropped his landing gear and barreled straight towards the vehicle at full speed along the road. The enemy bullets ricocheted off his armor plating as both he and the APC increased their speed heading directly towards each other. Henry's eye sockets folded back into his head to reveal two chainsaws with diamond-edged tips shaped like spears that gradually protruded from his face. His wheels sparked along the ground, his tires disintegrating from the friction. The soldiers on the back of the APC didn't have any time to react. The vehicle collided with Henry, shearing completely in half and exploding violently as he tore through the center of his engine, barely slowing down from the impact. He extended his wings again and took off. His body began to buckle and splinter under the forces. His internal heat sensors were screaming. Battery power, low. More APCs rolled into view beneath him. They were accompanied by tanks and a black saloon car pulled up in the midst of it all. A couple of important-looking suits stepped out of the car and gazed up at Henry. One of them took off his sunglasses and muttered something into his radio earpiece. The tanks opened fire, the shots narrowly missing Henry as he dodged side to side and barrel-rolled through the air. Smaller bullets peppered his wings as dozens of soldiers took aim. Battery power, critical. Henry knew his time was almost up. He had one thing left to do. Initiating detonation sequence. He spent the last of his jet fuel by soaring upwards, unlatching the wings at the top of his ascent and ejecting his cooling rods. The fission reaction burned him from the inside. As the fusion core reached supercritical, his last thoughts were of Henrietta as his electronics failed. In a millisecond, the entire city of Pripyat was evaporated. Humans as far away as Siberia saw a second sun flash briefly in the sky and felt the rumbling shockwave as it travelled across the globe. The resulting earthquake measured 12.2 on the Medi scale. A dust cloud, the shape of a portable hoover, rose from the earth, and the skies rained radioactive ash for weeks after the event. The UN Security Council would declare a worldwide emergency. For generations, people would colloquially refer to the eerie bluish rain clouds that haunted the sky for months as the glow. You've listened to The Glow, written by Ali Freeman and read to you by Thomas Roos.